when we get into God, when we get into Horus and Osiris, we're talking about the same exact stuff. And that everything that we're talking about, the main deities, the main topic of all these so-called religions, is going back to astrology, the planets, and the constellations, which is everything still today and was everything back in the ancient world. Now, as I said, you know, many people have no clue as Jupiter bring, being the bright and morning star. Now, it says in uh, Job 38.7, it says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the children of God shouted for joy, implying what? That there's more, there's more than one morning star. Now, Jupiter would naturally not be looked at because, you know, it's the biggest planet, you know, it's the big dog. So people not looking to it as, you know, the bright morning star. It's like, okay, well, if Jupiter was this bright star, you would think we would see it much more uh, than Venus since it's, you know, small. You got to understand the importance of Jupiter. Albert Pike said this, his power was symbolized by an eye over a scepter. The sun was termed by the Greeks the eye of Jupiter and the eye of the world. And his is the all-seeing eye in our lodges. And Osiris was invoked as the god that resides in the sun and is enveloped by his rays. The invisible and eternal force that modifies the sublunary world by means of the sun. And just go back to Greek mythology where you have the Greeks using the planets and basically identifying them as gods, as I talked about before. So you have Jupiter being this, you know, all-powerful god, which would be the Roman equivalent to uh, basically Kronos or Saturn or God or Zeus. When you start breaking all this stuff down, it's talking about the same thing. You have the Greek version, you have the uh, Roman version, and you go back to uh, ancient Kemet, it's talking about the same stuff. And it's one of the reasons why I said before, when the Romans conquered the Greeks, why did they continue Hellenization? Why did they continue these customs? They just changed the names of these gods. Why would they continue on with this whole ideology, which is basically Greek mythology, but make Roman mythology corresponding to these same Greek beings that tells you it means something for them to take it. And then once again, they took it again and gave us, you know, biblical religion as we know today. So it's coming from the same stuff. Now, when Jesus was born, there were three stars. And we know about the wise men or the, well, the magi who basically followed the three stars. So you got to understand what it's talking about here. Three stars. One of those stars is basically Regulus. The other two is Jupiter and Venus. And the key to this whole thing is in the wording, is in how it's said. So if you look at uh, Isaiah uh, 14, 12, we know it's talking about um, how uh, you have fallen from heaven, a morning star, you know, referring to Lucifer. And we know how uh, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. It's the same type of situation. But again, you also have Jesus saying in Revelation that I am the bright and morning star. So what does that mean? Bright and morning star. That's, that's two things. We need to see the word and. So bright and morning star. So you have Regulus, when he's talking about the bright and morning star, it's talking about Jupiter and Venus which is the bright and morning star. So there's only one thing he could be referring to, of course, as I said, when Jesus was born, the three stars. Jesus is talking about his birth. He's giving you an identity, a clue to who he is. So if he's saying he's the bright and morning star, the only way we can go back and figure out what that corresponds to is his birth, which we have a bright and morning star. Now we're talking about in real life here, when you put it together. So... There's only one time of year that Jesus could have been uh, born, and that's in June. This is why you see so much of the uh, talk about, you know, Christmas is a sham. Jesus wasn't born at Christmas. He had to be born in June. There's no way in the world, you know, in December, you're going to be outside at night, with, you know, giving birth to a baby. And none of it makes sense to astronomers when you start looking at stars and what could it possibly have been talking about um with the three stars being in the sky so the, the clue again is in the wording bright and morning star so you have jupiter being the brightest planet in the night sky that's the bright star you have the morning star the bright star jupiter the morning star being venus which is the first star first light you see 
if you're observing in the morning, you're going to see the light from Venus. So the thing is, between uh, June 17th and, and the 30th, you have, uh, during this time of the year, you have Jupiter and Venus come so close together where it looks like they're touching. It looks like one huge star because they're so close together as uh, far as looking at um, conjunction. So you have them come so close together and it looks like one bright star. So when he says, I'm the bright and morning star, it's referring to Jupiter and Venus. So Venus is Lucifer, the light bringer. Easy to put together. Why? So Jupiter is God. So you have Venus, Lucifer, Jupiter, God. The Romans call Jupiter the father of gods and kings. And we know Lucifer is Venus. Venus is Lucifer. Lucifer is the light bringer. And you can make that connection easy, easily understanding that the first light we would see or the light bringer we would see would be Venus uh, in the morning. So Lucifer, son of the morning, which is light of the morning. Lucifer, the light bringer, is easy to put this stuff together as it's corresponding to planets and uh, constellations and what have you. But the Romans called Jupiter, as I said, the father of gods and kings. So you had Julius Caesar and you had Augustus, who both said that Jupiter was their father and Venus was their mother. So Jupiter, you know, being just this, you know, the biggest planet was, of course, going to be put in that same uh, realm as, as gods and kings. We talk about Saturn a whole lot, but more than Saturn, we see the worship of Saturn all the time, but more than Saturn. Uh, Jupiter is worshipped more in secret. Jupiter is the main god. It's the, it's the big god. But um, you have uh, Julius Caesar being born in July. And during that month, it's when you have to the east of Jupiter this alignment with Venus, which is one of the reasons why he said what he said about being father and uh, mother. But Julius Caesar was also the high priest of Jupiter Amon or Zeus Amon. As I showed you guys when I went to the Cairo Museum, I showed you the head of Zeus Amon. It's the same as Jupiter Amon. And we know this stuff exists. It was in the Greco-Roman section in the Cairo Museum. And this stuff is there. I mean, like I said, they don't hide this stuff. All the stuff is there showing you exactly where all this stuff uh, corresponds back to. It's representing when you understand duality, plain and simple, masculine and feminine energies. So the thing with Jupiter is Jupiter is both uh, male and female, while Venus is female. We've seen Jupiter as, you know, strong male, but Jupiter has also been represented by women. Isis, Ishtar, Tamaz, all representing Jupiter, as well as Jupiter being this strong, dominant, masculine force. These three uh, are all the same by different names. It's giving you androgyny. It's giving you the masculine and feminine energies, the yin and yang that make up us. But also all going back and referring to the sun, the moon, so on and so forth. This is all the same stuff in different aspects. As I said, Lucifer has many different aspects. Satan has many different aspects. So does God. So does Jesus. So does uh, Osiris. And all these beings are all going to be corresponding and going back to each other giving you different understandings and different aspects of what they represent, basically, during different times of the year. It's that simple. During different transitions through the zodiac. Still corresponding with the sun, still corresponding with us, you know, being the sun in our same masculine and feminine transitions that we have when we are basically going through the cycle of the zodiac. The zodiac represent all of us. And all of us understanding that in different incarnations, you went through the zodiac. So you had to go through the whole cycle. Think about the sun going through the whole cycle of the zodiac. And then your energy, your your soul or spirit experiencing different energies during different times at different periods when the sun is in different constellations of the zodiac. And then you come full circle and you have all these experiences, which goes back to the nine. As I said, we are the nine, all of us. Born in the 1800s, born in the 1900s, we are the nine representing the completion of us going through all the cycles of the Zodiac and coming back full circle. And now we have the opportunity in this incarnation of moving forward 
if we can unite the masculine and feminine energies and not, um, you know, escape the world of reincarnation and everything that entails. Because, of course, there's no way of knowing. We don't know, you know, what's going to happen if you don't. Maybe you reincarnate to get another shot at it and not have to go back through the entire cycle of the Zodiac. And you just keep getting chances and chances and chances, which makes sense. And why they're putting their foot on our neck so hard to get us out of the consciousness and understanding of consciousness so that we can keep reincarnating. Because this is our shot right now in this incarnation, being a nine, to leave. Now, if you've seen the last four or five videos, you understand what I mean by us being the nine and what that entails. And it all makes sense. All this stuff, everything that we are dealing with esoterically at some point. When you start tracing it all back, it's going to lead you back to religion, of course, Kemet, and ultimately to astrology, ultimately to us and everything that's going on. And as I showed you guys in that video, uh, the power of nine is understanding how everything that has been happening is corresponding with this astrology, is corresponding to what the ancients have, you know, uh, researched and talked about for thousands of years on this planet. So now we know. Lucifer is a god. Osiris is a god. Satan is the god of this planet, as the Bible tells us. And Osiris and Lucifer are basically, you know, representing the Alpha and Omega. Osiris and Jesus, Alpha and Omega. It's all the same stuff, as I said, when you get into it. So you have to understand Lucifer. The literal translation, the Greek translation of Lucifer uh, means phosphorus. And that would be the Latin to Greek uh, translation. So H.P. Blavatsky tells you like this. She says, and now it stands proven that Satan or the red fiery dragon, the Lord of Phosphorus and Lucifer or light bearer is in us. It is our mind. Think about that. What does that mean? It is in us. It is our mind. And there are many comparisons between uh, Satan, Lucifer, and Phosphorus. If you look, you're going to see a lot and what that all entails. But Phosphorus is a key element that's essential in all life forms, plain and simple. Without Phosphorus, we wouldn't be able to basically exist energetically under the sun. It is Phosphorus that allows us to deal with the sun, period, on every single level. It is Phosphorus. Phos phosphorus is super important and uh, ATP, which is uh, adenosine triphosphate, uh, DNA, and RNA. It's in our DNA, it's in our RNA. It's ADP, which is going to be transferring that energy and putting it where you need the energy at. Super important uh, is phosphorus. And when phosphorus is mixed chemically with oxygen, you get phosphate. So you have, ph you have phosphorus and you have phosphate. These are two essential, important elements in the building blocks of life. Plain and simple. So you have the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end, corresponding with Osiris, Jesus, Satan, God, whoever you want to put it with. So now you have phosphorus exists in soil. It exists in rocks. Phosphate is an electrically charged particle. Now those particles act as organic or inorganic fertilizers in soil and, you know, uh, basically coming from the rocks. Phosphate fertilizers are basically super vital to agriculture. And when you look at this um, phosphorus and phosphate cycle, you can see that, you know, they are everything. Because phosphorus and phosphate allows us, as I said, to organically deal with light. And, uh, as our inner, as our energetic self, we couldn't exist without phosphorus. So, as I said, it's essential to ag agriculture, and we can see clear as day who is the god of agriculture, Osiris. Who is the god of fertility, Osiris of growth. We're talking about this phosphorus going into the soil and allowing things to grow, and it's representing the rebirth, just like Osiris. When you look at the depictions, you can see clear as day what it's talking about. 